Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. We need to roll back the state. We spy on all of our own citizens. Our prisons are flooded with nonviolent drug offenders. If you want to know who America's next enemy is, look at who we're funding right now. Every single one of these problems are a result of government being way too big. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I am Dave Smith. I am joined, as always, by Robbie the Fire Bernstein, the king of the cocks. What's up, my brother? Nothing much, Davey Smith. How was your weekend? Jersey Uh, Shore lifestyle. Good, good, solid weekend. Hanging out with the family. No complaints. How about you? What'd you do, buddy? Uh, Oh, I did the whole Passover thing. It was a nice time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did not. I did not uh, do Passover this year. I just... Yeah, it's You're just, going uh, now, dude. You live in Jersey Shore well, lifestyle. What do you got to care about Passover for? I don't know if I'd call myself you a You got goy your Gentile babies? As, uh, I'm, I like to think of myself as a Christian conservative. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, moving the baby around and stuff. And they did it down at my sister's house. And I just, I, I couldn't get all the way there. So anyway, but I will uh, repent or atone, whatever don't the worry, I don't think you missed much. It was the same as last year. It'll be the same thing next year. I love, I think, what was it? It was a few years ago when we actually went over the story of Passover. And if you just tell it in like plain English, how <laughs> fucked the whole thing is. Like, um, I don't know. Moses, you know, he was pissed off at the Pharaoh. I mean, Moses first thought he was like living with the Pharaohs and he was like, yeah, screw these Jews. And then someone told him he was a Jew and he was like, whoa, maybe we shouldn't be so mean to the Jews. And then he told Pharaoh to let him go. And Pharaoh was like, fuck off. I literally gave you everything. <laughs> I raised you as my own. You're going to come here now, bitch, and be now. Oh, now you don't like that the, these Jewish slaves built all your stuff? Well, you've enjoyed the stuff for the last 20 years or whatever. And uh, Pharaoh didn't listen. And then eventually, uh, when they wouldn't listen, God murdered their babies. That was, I mean, there were a few steps in between, but ultimately murdered their babies And then Pharaoh was like, Jesus Christ, I did not realize your God was such a sick, bloodthirsty animal. All right, fine, fine. Take your stupid Jews, like get it, get out of here. And then uh, they left and wandered around the desert for 40 years. At one point, uh, Moses went up a mountain and came down and found that some people had built a little uh, calf, I believe, um, which is a no-no. So he murdered all of them. I love just like the harsh Old Testament stories where you're like, there's a there's a moral in there somewhere in between all of the murdering Look, of innocent we, we, people. We just we just did the whole Seder. There, there, there was no go. reason for you to go. You got the story down. Yada, yada, yada. 45 minutes later, maybe you get to eat something. <laughs> all right. There you go. There. It uh, just felt felt good to get a little one minute Seder out of the way here. It's very concise, very concise Seder. Um, OK, so. I want to, I didn't mean to offend any of the religious people. I'm obviously, this is a Christian conservative show. We respect the Old Testament. A lot of these wrongs were righted later down the line. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the, the story that I want to start with today that I think is um, the, one of the most uh, uh, terrifying and, and really concerning developments that's uh, really been talked about a lot lately. This is something that we all saw coming to one degree or another, but there is now major talk of COVID passports and uh, not just uh, like speculation, actual plans are being laid down and the Biden administration is currently in talks with private businesses to work on a unified COVID passport. This is the type of thing that would have been considered tinfoil hat wild conspiracies just a couple years ago. I mean, just, if you had even suggested this, people would have been like, you're insane if you're worried that the government's going to do this. And then, man, that boiling frog really doesn't take that long. Just a year of all this craziness. And now people are not only um, are, is it not the stuff of wild tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists, but in fact, Uh, A lot of people are going, well, you know, it does kind of make sense. Maybe we need to have the government monitor everything about where we are in our medical records and all of this. Um, I just, uh, you know, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, but I cannot stress enough how much I think that this should be 
Um, this should be fought with every fiber of our being. There should be a huge movement against this. Uh, I'll get more into that later. But if there was ever a time that people need to um, vocally rise up in opposition to a, a government proposal, this is it right now. Um, what are your thoughts on COVID passports? Well, there, there's a lot of uh, um, levels here of that. First, we don't quite know that if you don't have symptoms, you're transmitting the virus, as far as I understand, mm -hmm. or at least that there's some sort of a factor of shed rate. And so even if you are able to transmit the virus, it's probably not likely. Then there's also the question of what are what are the odds that you actually have this virus? And then if everyone else can get the vaccines so that they're protected from it. So then who exactly am I putting at risk? by not having the vaccine like who who exactly is a victim by me going outside without the vaccine if i and by the way i'm not saying you shouldn't be able to maybe be able to pre-screen for other symptoms i get it you want to do a the little head check thing to see if you got other sure. symptoms to go hey there might be shed right here maybe that's maybe that's reasonable you own the airlines i don't know the airlines you want to check that before a flight that's not government that's you your business like sure, sure. Th that's fine uh but if you just look at the what is the harm of me leaving my house unvaccinated? Who exactly am I harming? And then you also look at the fact that these drug companies were, you know, they're not liable for lawsuits. So you're going to force me to take something like where the risk of it is not totally quant. Like, you know, I, I don't know. That puts us in a framework where you have to so socialize government to say that they're going to be responsible for any of the damages that might come from these vaccines. And I don't want to be a person spreading fear about the vaccines. I think it's just one of those things that there's no reason if you're under the age of 40 to, and you don't have other, like, what's your, what's the, what's the risk of death because of COVID? It's like, they've created so much nonsense of keeping us in our houses and pretending like there's this crazy risk and then going, Hey, but as long as you take this thing, then it, that the, what the risk wasn't really out there. The big punishment yeah. was that government just locked us in. It's all fabrication. Yeah. Oh, look, I'll say this. I mean, just in terms of like how necessary this is to do, not at all, not not even slightly. There is no need to do anything like this insane uh, COVID passport bullshit, which for people who don't know would just be basically like proof that you've been vaccinated. And the ideas that are are being thrown out there are that you could not travel on an airport, go to a concert, go to certain businesses, do certain events, uh, go in government buildings, any of these things without um, having proof that you've been vaccinated. Now, just to be clear, if um, if we get to the point where the vaccine is is available for anyone who wants it, that's it. There's no more even um, plausible uh, argument that the, any of this is necessary. The people who don't want to get it don't have to get it. They are comfortable taking their own risks. As you pointed out, for the vast, vast majority of people, particularly young, reasonably healthy people, COVID poses no serious risk for them at all. Um, and so if they want to take that risk, they're comfortable taking it. And others who would rather be vaccinated can go be vaccinated. Absolutely no need to do any of this shit. But I just like, uh, I mean, again, I can't stress this enough that if two years ago you had just started talking about the government doing this on paper uh, or just having a conversation about the government doing this, you would have been laughed out as like, OK, you're some kook. This is beyond Alex Jones type shit. Right. But now they're doing it. And to, to have to explain to anyone the dangers of of allowing the government to look, this is what I don't care how you want to spin it. This is forced vaccinations. It's actually quite a bit worse than forced vaccinations. I mean, it's forced vaccinations. I don't care if you say they're OK, they're not technically putting a gun to your head and holding you in a chair and making you, uh, you know, get vaccinated. But if they're going to say that you can't do anything without the vaccination, it's in effect the same thing. And um, it, again, like you, you could argue that private businesses have a right to do what they want to do. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to agree with them doing it. Um, but yes, they have a right to take whatever measures they want to. But of course, the government has absolutely no right to get in, involved in any of this shit. And, and by the way, it won't even play out that way because the businesses that say will gladly welcome people without vaccines, there will be laws or other, you know, just general news shame thrown their way. Yes. And, and just to be clear for any like, yes, that's exactly right. But just to be clear for any libertarians, you know, who are like, well, uh, you know, a private business has a right to do what they want to do. OK, well, right now, and this is just from CNN. 
uh, their headline, Biden administration helping develop standards to prove vaccination. You know, the Biden administration is working with these companies. This is not something that's just happening in the market. This is going to be, we're, we're living in a system where the government has rigged the entire system toward the big corporations in their favor, spent the last year just throwing trillions of dollars at these huge corporations while destroying the, the you know, small businesses of the country through direct government policy. They've destroyed the government, uh, the, the middle class, they've destroyed the midsize and small businesses, and they've, they've just thrown trillions of dollars at big corporations. And now they're gonna work with those big corporations, these crony corporations, to develop standards for who's allowed to do anything. So if you wanna call this any type of like free market situation, that's just absurd. This is obviously a top-down state system. Um, and now there, this is, so not only is it, is it in effect forced vaccinations, it's actually quite a bit worse than that. Cause at least if the government just like forced everyone to, to take a vaccine, it's like, okay, they forced you, it's over and done with, and now you move on. This is, uh, an absolute destruction of medical privacy. It's a destruction of any type of freedom, um, to, to, to move without the government tracing you, knowing your records, the, the, um, potential for abuse in with, with this new creation is extraordinary. This is something that we literally should be prepared to focus all of our energy on fighting against. And to speak to that abuse, it's kind of when you have a run in with a cop and there's almost um, they create suspicion by not being compliant towards them when actually there are laws that are supposed to be able to protect you from them. Like when they go, you have to show a cop your identification. And if not, things seem to escalate pretty quickly. You also have if they ask for a search, I mean, you can decline it, but then things escalate pretty quickly. They do a pretty good job of turning things around you to make it seem that um they are in the norm for making the request and that you not being compliant. And that's probably true. I don't quite understand how DUI laws work or, but they can then revoke your license. If you know, if you're um, declining the request, how quickly will that basically escalate when it comes to these health passports? Because all of a sudden there's going to be some other thing that I have to have on me and show. And so if I can't show it, then what am I going to jail because I'm out without it? And then how quickly is other information going to be required for me to be on that? Th like, it just seems, you know, at least my ID was just a picture, my name, we were done with it. Now there's some other piece of information that you're going to have to have on you at all times. And like you were saying, you know, that there, how quickly does that escalate and how creepy does that become? Yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, this, the, like I said, the, the potential for abuse here is, uh, it would be impossible to to overstate it. It's, this is like some, this is real deal, this is it, real deal Orwellian fucking totalitarian, you know, like uh, government control of, of society. And of course, it'll be in the American flavor. It will be a mix of, you know, um, uh, uh, corporate and government control, as is already, as CNN is writing, it's already, you know, the, the government and the corporations getting together and writing all these rules together themselves. It'll be, you know, that that's what's going to happen here. And um, I would just say this, right? Like, the, the reason why I'm so adamant that this needs to be really vocally opposed right now is that this is the time that it can still be stopped. There, there is the, the way these things in society work, right? are that there's always, th there is something um, almost democratic in spirit about the way uh, societies work. You know, I've, I've talked about this for years, but if um, you could have some uh, complete uh, despot, you know, like dictator who is never elected, right? Uh, never elected, he just decides all the policies on a whim. But if there are 50,000 screaming angry citizens outside his castle with you know torches and guns and they're they mean business and they are screaming we demand policy x or we're going to drag you out of this this palace you know the dictator literally usually turns around and goes you know i've thought about it and i've decided we're going to institute policy x because there is this force that you can only get away with as much as you think actually won't 
have the people dragging you out of their palaces because there there are more of the people than there are of the ruling elite. That's always the case in every society, right? So e even with our society, um, there there are lines that they try to flirt with and push and test whether we can actually get this done. There's lots of examples of this. I mean, they they proposed bills to regulate the uh, the internet back at the beginning of the Obama administration. And there was huge uproar about it. And they pulled them back. It, like, if it's going to upset people too much, they go, mm, okay, not quite ready. We got to boil that frog a little bit more. And then they try to come back and they do it in different ways, net neutrality or whatever, you know. Um, it's not like the fight's over when you win. But they tried to push us into a full-out war in Syria. And people stood up against it. There was just no support for it. And they pulled it back. It is not impossible for there to be such a huge outcry about this that they go, uh, you know what, we're just not going to do it. That is possible. What's much, much harder is once it becomes law to get it rolled back. That Once the government takes that power, it's much, much harder to get it back from them. And you could think of after 9-11, you know, they used that fear to cram all the new post 9-11 shit, you know, Department of Homeland Security, all that shit. You know, the TSA is still groping old people. Everyone knows it's a fucking joke. Everyone knows the TSA is a joke. They run these tests over and over with plastic explosives, like 90% of them get through. They do nothing to protect us, but they're not going anywhere because we already created this department, created this bureaucracy, gave the government this power, very hard to roll it back. The time to stop the COVID passports is right now. And if we don't do it right now, we are in big trouble, big trouble. So we need to step up and, and, and oppose this vocally right now. And God damn it, every libertarian, every single libertarian needs to be against this. I mean, come on, even the libertarians who aren't like on my, you know, in my camp of the libertarian world, you know, there's these ones who are lecturing me about open borders and shit like that. OK, so you're you're for open borders, but you're OK with a covid passport. You're OK with the government telling people who within the country can travel where a, 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 and can't. I mean, come on, like if you can't be against this and this is this has been the center of my message to libertarians for the last year. You have to be there in the moment when the thing is actually happening on the right side. Otherwise, you're useless. Otherwise, you're just as useless as everybody else is. And, and yeah, 20 years after the fact, you can say, oh, yeah, I guess we were pretty good on that issue now when everyone's good on it. That doesn't mean anything, you know, and, and I'm just saying I've been fucking right about all this shit for the last year. So, you know, like I, I was sitting there, you know, telling all these people like we have to oppose the lockdowns because we're libertarians. And then it's like you're like, well, yeah, but it is smart to wear a mask and socially distance and all this. And then like fucking. You know, a year later, you look back and Florida's doing better than half the states that locked down. And you're like, oh, yeah, it would have been kind of nice if we were those people, right? If we were the ones supporting freedom when it really mattered. And, and, and again, with the, the fucking, you know, Black Lives Matter riots over the summer, I was like, no, 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 we need to oppose riots. We can't just agree with the, the corporate press that they're mostly peaceful, but somewhat fiery. And then, of course, by the, the fall... You know, Joe Biden is giving speeches against the riots and everyone's condemning the riots and then it's easy to. But we need to be doing this shit when it matters. And right now is when it matters. Oppose COVID passports. All of them. We are against this. This is so easy for any libertarian to do. It's a slam dunk. No one. Ha you have the right to medical privacy. You have the right to freedom of travel, to freedom of commerce. You can do business with whoever you want to. They have absolutely no right to tell you this. I'm sorry. That there is, it is, it is absurd, absolutely absurd to tell some healthy 40 year old, some healthy 30 year old that they can't travel if they do not get a brand new vaccine for a virus that poses no measurable threat to them. That if they were to get this thing, they might get a little bit sick. That's basically what might happen. If there, we do things for, for a healthy 30 year old. You will do 25 things today that are more dangerous than risking COVID, okay? And, and we, we cannot set this standard of, oh, but because there might be a 0.001% chance that something bad could happen to you, eh, the government can just snatch all your freedom and your medical records and essentially force you to be vaccinated. But look at the writing on the wall, man. Oppose this now.
I think we can just hope that uh, it, whatever standards to download this app or have the passport are uh, so hard that poor people can't do it, and then they'll call it racist, and then we might not actually have to have it. That's the only hope we got. Yeah, right. whatever. I'll take whatever angle we can. Oh, yeah, this is racist. <laughs> I think this is racist. It's going to disproportionately affect communities of color. Yeah, they don't we have, have uh, poor people don't have smartphones. Can you imagine yeah. having to go to like another DMV with health records in order to like verify your health passport and vaccine? Jesus Christ, that would be a nightmare. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our awesome sponsor for today's show, which is Cuts Clothing. Fellas, the sport of business means demanding excellence from your craft and your wardrobe. Your fits need to be versatile, blending timeless style and comfort so that you look as good as you feel. For that, there's Cuts Clothing. They've taken a classic men's fashion staple, the plain tee, and refined it, combining premium quality with a minimalist aesthetic. This is incredible, guys. It's a game changer. If you're like me, you don't want to wake up in the morning and have to think about what you're going to wear, think about what's going to look good. What you want is just some simple, classic clothing that's going to make you look good. It's going to feel right. It's something you could wear hanging out. It's something you could wear to the virtual office. It's something you could go you know, to a bar in and just look good and be comfortable. In 2016, Cuts founder Steve Borelli set out to create clothes ready for every occasion the modern man faces. He started by reinventing the t-shirt. The end result was what GQ magazine calls the only shirt worth wearing. Their signature buttery soft Pika Pro Tri-Blend Tee. It's a bold new take on a classic design, combining the ultimate blend of high quality cotton, polyester, and spandex. The perfect t-shirt accomplished. Consider the new Cuts hoodie where they developed Hyperloop French Terry fabric, a textile that's temperature controlled and ageless. Cuts is premium with a purpose. Each piece of clothing is designed with custom engineered fabric, expertly graded for the perfect fit, arming you for every challenge and opportunity. It's not just a lifestyle, it's not just clothing, it's office leisure apparel for the sport of business. And you can get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash P-O-T-P. That's cutsclothing.com slash P-O-T-P for 15% off the only shirt worth wearing. All right, let's get back into the show. You know, uh, fucking Scott Horton was saying this recently. He was on a um, uh, David Fights podcast, who's great. He's he's great. And uh, Scott Horton was on his show, and he was talking about it like this, but I think it's such a great... I think me and Scott have actually talked about this before, like on the phone. But he was putting it this way, and he was talking about the income tax. And he was saying how, uh, you know, like we're for, you know, just abolishing the IRS and abolishing the income tax and all this. And Scott was like... The, you know, like I'll saying this in my own words, but he was like, you know, that's so crazy is that it sounds crazy to say that to say like, yeah, I'm for abolishing the income tax and abolishing the IRS. Like, that's like, wow, that's that's pretty radical. But if this was if we didn't have them and this was a new proposal, you'd realize how insane the whole thing was. Like if you just and, and he starts going like uh, in, in this way where he's like, um, so we are going to uh we are going to make um working a crime and it's punishable by fine we will fine you for earning money and the more you work the more of a crime it is so the more we're going to fine you and we are going to um and and we're going to repeal the 5th amendment you have no right to not incriminate yourself. You're actually legally obligated to incriminate yourself. And we can go through all of your records. We can force every business to keep all of their records on every employees that we can, because not only do we want to find that business for the crime of, of working and hiring people, but we also want to find all of their employees for the crime of working. And we're going to collect all of this money. We can come at you in any way we want to. We can go back as far into the past as we want to. There's no statute of limitations, complete invasion of privacy privacy because we basically own you. You're all going to suffer under this soft slavery of having to report to us if you dare to take care of yourself and your family. That's like the new system. And I go, and if you were just proposing that and we didn't have that, you'd be like, wait, wait, who's the radical here? I'm the radical for saying I don't want that. And, and hence, you know, Scott said at one point, he goes, well, imagine a foreign country, like we didn't have an income tax. We were a somewhat free society and a foreign country invaded us and said, now that we've conquered you, we are going to subject you to this 
income tax. Like now that we've now that we've invaded and conquered you, we're going to make working a crime punishable by a fine, which, by the way, if not paid or if you don't represent yourself or if you, you know, like uh, lie at all in these documents that we, we will throw you in jail for it also like that would be like, oh, yeah, this we've been, you know, conquered and enslaved by a foreign power. We should probably take up arms and fight against them. But because it's our own government, because it's it's what the Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C., somehow it's just kind of like, well, that's policy, I guess. So all I'm saying is just think of the covid passport like that. Think of it if Russia invaded the United States of America and tried to institute this policy uh, uh, on us, how we would feel, how we would rightfully feel that we had been conquered and enslaved by a foreign uh, power. Well, that's what's happening. Just because it's the Democrats and the lawyer, uh, and the Republicans, just because it's some group of lawyers in Washington, D.C., instead of being a foreign power, it doesn't change the moral character of it. it. doesn't change the real threat that we face. Fuck that. Medical records are private. You have no right to know what anybody's medical records are. And, and, and the, you know, the government uh, has absolutely no role, particularly the federal government, it's absolutely no role, no right to get involved with any of this shit. And also, it's not necessary. Like, if the vaccine is everything that they claim it is, then what the fuck are we talking about here? Cases are falling, immunity is going up, the, the people who really need the vaccine are getting it. And that's all. Honestly, like, if you understand COVID at all, and, and you think this vaccine is great, and it works, or the, the few vaccines that are out there, all you need is to get the vulnerable people vaccinated. That's it. If, if, if you're talking about people who don't have underlying health conditions, COVID is is really not that big of a deal. It's just a big deal to people who no. do have underlying health conditions. We moved on from flattening the curve and protecting grandma to, I guess, zero cases and 100% vaccination. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, I mean, it's really something to to see all of this, this happen over this last year, man. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. But yeah, that's right. The the idea of flattening the curve, that that is pretty long gone, pretty long gone. And um, there's just not I, I don't know what to say. It just doesn't it doesn't warrant this. And even if it did, the risks of this type of show like that, you want to talk about a show me your papers state. That's really what we're flirting with now. Fuck that. Fuck COVID passports. Do not stand for this shit. I don't know what else to say. The other part of it that's somewhat interesting to me is that usually like your example that you've said a million times that the the reason capitalism works so well is that you can take a, a Muslim cab driver, you hand him money, he goes you across. It. Look, everyone's getting along. And what's interesting is that, you know, in your daily interactions, we all you know, there's a sign of bars, no, no religion, no politics. There's a reason not to bring up politics. There's a lot of things that a lot of people can get along about um, that having to wear masks or having all of a sudden you are bringing politics into this because while you pretend like, hey, this is just a follow the sign, it's not. Some of us have a different point of view. And there's a lot of politicians that actually represent our point of view, a lot of scientists that re yeah. represent our point of view. And now all of a sudden I got to cater to your point of view of wearing to the mask. And now you actually do almost force people to confront each other on their politics as opposed to just being able to live your life. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, right, like there's a, there's this fucking contradiction um, or at least seemingly uh, like contradictory, uh, you know, views that that a libertarian has, which is basically like um, or at least libertarians who talk about politics. Right. So it's like someone like me, like I talk about politics all the fucking time. And the central underlying message of the whole thing is that politics shouldn't exist, you know, so it's like you talk about this thing all the time that you're like, this this shouldn't be something we need to talk about all the time. Like if I'm talking about the wars and I'm like, we should end all of these wars. Well, if they ended, then there's no need to talk about them because they don't exist anymore. You wouldn't spend all day talking about how great it is that we're not in these wars. Then you can move on to something else that's better to talk about. Um, but to, to your point, and, and this is what I always talk about, about markets versus politics. Or, or versus state power. I'm talking about political, you know, uh, uh, government related politics, not like office politics. Um, is that the right? Like to your example, where you say talking about politics can lead to all types of like arguments and all these problems. Whereas 
if you're just talking about other shit, that just doesn't really seem to be as big of an issue. And why is that? I mean, like, like the example that I always use that you were bringing up was I was always saying like, look, I'm like, I'm a Jew and I grew up in New York City and the Muslims predominantly were are the cab drivers. Um, that's just for whatever reason, that's a lot of Muslims went into driving cabs. That's kind of changed since Uber and Lyft and all them came around. But it used to be like the vast majority of the yellow cab drivers were Muslims. Now, if you were to think about how many views I have that are so different than the views that the average Muslim cab driver has, you know, just all, all types of views about society, about God, about, you know what I mean, like uh, women and, and, you know, gays and sports and just like everything you could think of. We have wildly different worldviews. But I put my hand out and he stops over and he takes me where I need to go. And then at the end, he's like, God bless. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. And, and we leave because we're all like in that moment, our goals align and he's providing value for me and I'm providing value for him. And we're exchanging like our subjective values. Like I value this ride over this $20 and he values this $20 over driving me because he's already in a car driving around and I'm not in a car driving around and I don't want to walk anymore, you know, whatever. Um, so there is something about the market, these voluntary transactions that bring people together. It incentivizes us to say, let's not sit here and focus on fighting over our religious differences, right? or fighting over what, you know, what our views of the, the nature of man is or something like that, because we're both kind of incentivized. He wants the 20. I want the ride. Let's let's do a deal here and work things out there. You can be in a bar with people who have wildly different views about so many, like really important things. I mean, just think about like, you know, a, a Christian and an atheist in a, in a bar together. I mean, like these people have Think about the difference, right, between like somebody who's religious and somebody who's not and how profound a disagreement that is. It's not like a minor thing. Like it's way more important than anything political, right? Like one of you believes that there's an afterlife and that this life we're in right now is a tiny little speck compared to the eternity that we're going to after this and that the way you're living you are going to be in a pit of fire for eternity, right? Like they believe that with their, with their heart and soul. And the other person sitting next to him believes that that person is delusional, that what they hold closest and dearest to their hearts and what they base their entire life around is a delusion, a, a, a delusion at best, a mental illness at worst, right? But they work together, they chat together, they talk about sports and, you know, I don't know, buildings and neighborhoods and schools and whatever else, you know, comes up at a bar and they talk about their wives. They talk about their girlfriends or their brothers or their sisters, or, you know, it's like all of that's just, hey, look, we have these differences. I don't know. Human beings can get past that real quick. But why is it that politics becomes such a thing? Where it's like you better not be in front you better not be friends with this guy oh my god i can't believe you voted for that guy i can't believe you supported this and and the reason is because politics is about power and it's about who holds power over the other person that doesn't really matter whatever you believe or i believe because your beliefs have no power over me you know so we can just kind of be friends but when it comes to issues of who gets to rule over the other one well now we have to fight and that and a little microcosm basically explains the entire culture war. Now, this is why, as the government's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, the culture war has gotten hotter and hotter and hotter. Because we have to fight for these reasons that we really shouldn't be fighting for. It really shouldn't matter. Your, your attitudes about traditional lifestyles and your attitudes about non-traditional lifestyles just really don't matter. You know, in, they, I shouldn't say they don't matter. They don't matter in terms of how well two people can get along. They're just in the same way that like some Christian can believe that he's, you know, there's an afterlife and some atheist can believe that that's a delusion and they can still, it, it's, it's never an issue when you go to drop your dry cleaning off, which one of you believes which, right? It's just not an issue. doesn't come up. It's just that guy wants business and you want your clothes cleaned. And you're completely incentivized to leave all that shit at the door. But politics is different because it's about who rules over who. Um, so that being said, 
I think the moral of all of this is oppose COVID passports with everything that you have. Oppose these things because this is going to get really bad. This to me was always some aspect of this was always kind of the long term scariest thing about uh, the whole last year, the whole COVID business. This was the scariest thing. I mean, there were short term things that were really scary, like the potential for for riots and um, food shortages and, and all stuff like that, you know, which happened to some degree, but didn't happen as bad as as like a worst case scenario could be, thank God. Um, but the long term fear was always something like th this just really leading to some type of technocratic true surveillance police state where the, your 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 movement is being tracked your medical records are being tracked everything the government and big corporations have their tentacles in every inch of your privacy um o over this you know and that i really think these covid passports have the potential to be all of that so i you know again like i said i think every every uh uh person who has not bought into the covid hysteria it's not just libertarians. I think obviously right wingers and I think the good left wingers who kind of see through this shit. I mean, come on, like Orwell was a left winger, right? So so follow that tradition, even if you're kind of like some type of democratic socialist or something like that, or even if you're a liberal or, or some type of leftist, you can still see the threats posed by a government that violates all of its citizens privacy, that violates all of their their freedom to travel and shit like that. So there is potential here to get a big group of people together who are like, fuck, no, we're not doing this. I hope. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Uh, what else did you want to talk about, Rob? We got uh, the uh, Ted Cruz going to the border. Ted Cruz, everybody knows, wears his heart on his sleeve, <laughs> uh, uh, playing the violin, Went down to the border. He's appalled. He's appalled by what he saw. What did he see down there, Rob? It was Well, it's unclear. He stood in the bushes and pretended like he was nearly under attack. But then he also got into one of the facilities. Mm -hmm. And then they had a uh, compassion off where he's trying to get the footage that maybe he can expose it and, uh, you know, generate some outrage and rectify the situation, make Biden look bad. And then a lady stands in front of him, blocking his view while saying, uh, please respect the privacy of the people we're trying to torture. Not you know, not using those words, but essentially, you know, they're having a compassionate offer. She's trying to respect his privacy and he's trying to expose um, the problem. Uh, to his credit, I mean, it's funny. I don't think uh, Ted Cruz is the world's most compassionate person, uh, but I do think and I think he's almost such a good lawyer that it doesn't work that well in the political space because he's just, you know, 100 percent son of a bitch. Uh but in this case, the game that they're playing is they're trying to expose Biden and the tragedy that's his fault. They want this mm -hmm. thing to be his fault. Uh, but the one thing that he's actually doing well, he was on Fox News and typically speaking, government policies will have unintended consequences and they don't want to show us the unintended consequences. But if you actually look at economics, you can kind of predict them. In this case, he's actually formulating the argument where, where he goes, we knew that this was going to happen if you had this policy and this is not compassionate. Women are like, no, we know that young children are being raped. This is the compassionate that, I mean, this is your compassionate policy. Uh, so I like yeah. that this is the first time I'm actually seeing a Republican be able to stand up, point to like the unintended consequences and going, here's the compassion that you guys are pretending you're bringing. Yeah, I well, I OK, so I, I agree with what you're saying there. It did it did feel like a, a situation. I know I use this analogy too much, but if you remember um, at the end of uh, Naked Gun 33 and a third, when uh, uh, Frank Drebin, was that his name? Uh, uh, Leslie Nielsen's character is on stage at the Oscars and the uh, the bomb is in the envelope and uh, he gets the bomb away from the terrorist, but the terrorist gets his gun and is holding the gun to his his girlfriend's head and he's like what do you want to do here he goes i'll kill her and he's like no don't do that and then you know whatever uh, it's like they're having this whole thing and they're trying to negotiate what to do and he goes all right all right, all right. listen let's think about this logically you're the terrorist i'm the cop you should have the bomb i should have the gun and then they trade off and he gives the terrorist <laughs> the bomb and everyone's like, ah, oh. <laughs> like, why? You? Anyway, it's a really funny scene. The whole movie's hilarious. Uh, but it does, 
it did feel it was one of those moments, which happens a lot in the last few years where Ted Cruz and that woman, it just felt like you you should switch places. Like, it's like you're you're supposed to be over there. Like AOC is supposed to be the one visiting these camps and crying about how horrible the conditions of the children are. And you're supposed to be defending the tough law and order. Like, what are you guys doing? You're both. Like, but anyway, it's it's the whole thing is absurd. The thing is absurd. It's like the Democrats were screaming about kids being locked in cages. Now the Democrats are making excuses about kids being locked in cages. Well, what are we going to do? And now the Republicans are outraged about kids being locked in cages. And it's just there's so much hypocrisy. It's so blatant and it's hard to swallow. All of that aside, right? There is a real tragedy going on there. And some of that footage was just, oof. I mean, really gut wrenching stuff. And it was evidently there's there's this facility that I guess was um, the the one that Cruz was at was uh, I think they had a capacity they said of around a thousand they could fit about a thousand kids in there but due to COVID restrictions they should only be letting like thirteen hundred and they've got like over four thousand kids there they're right on top of each other they're sleeping on mats with those like um those like alumini uh, alumin uh, aluminum looking blankets, like the type of things you wrap a, um, like a marathon runner in after they've run, you know, that type of, and, and it's just, I, I mean, it's a nightmare. It's a goddamn nightmare. And you look at it and you're like, holy shit. I mean, how could this be, how could this be, how could we be this advanced of a society? And this is what we're, we're settling for is the solution here. It's just awful. It's, it's, you know, your heart really, you know, bleeds for, for those kids. Um, but what you were saying, to Ted Cruz's point, there is some merit to it. And what he was saying was that, um, you know, the, all the hypocrisy and stuff aside, what he was saying was that basically Trump had uh, Trump's policy during COVID was like, you're all getting turned away. And if people come up here, we're going to turn you right back away. You have to go back where you came from. And Joe Biden's uh, uh, policy was that for children six and under, we're not going to do that. We're not going to turn you away. We're not going to let you sit just right on the other side of the border. We'll take you in. Um, and so what you've seen is a mass influx of people with children, six and under, because the unintended consequence here essentially is that you have now incentivized bringing children six years and younger. And uh, Ted Cruz's claim, I, I you'd have to go fact check him on this, but he says that there's a lot of kid renting where people now know that they need a kid to get across the border. So um, your cartel guys are renting a kid and apparently some kids are coming over and over. And in the worst cases, he went so far as to claim that um, I, girls are being put on birth control because it's known that they're going to be raped en route. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there's there been a lot of reports of this for years of the amount of like sexual abuse of little girls um, on that, that journey. And it's a, uh, whew. Just just really horrible stuff. All right, guys, let's take a second and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is IP Vanish. Very happy to have them back on the show. IP Vanish has been a longtime sponsor of ours. Great to have them back with us. Let me tell you about IP Vanish. If you care about the security of your online activity, the easiest way to protect yourself is with an IP Vanish VPN. Rated 4.5 out of 5 on Trustpilot, IP Vanish provides an encrypted connection for all of your internet traffic, helping to prevent websites, Wi Fi providers, and even hackers from intercepting your data. You can keep financial details, personal information, and online activity safe from threats with IP Vanish. Get started with this limited time offer and save 50% off the monthly and annual subscriptions by going to ipvanish.com slash problem. One more time, that's ipvanish.com slash problem, all lowercase. It's really important today to protect your online privacy. It's only going to become more and more important. I highly recommend you check this out, ipvanish.com slash problem. All right, let's get back on the show. There's no question. I mean, I, again, I can't, you know, verify everything Ted Cruz was saying, but there's no question that it's been demonstrated many times that a lot of the people who come across with children, they claim they're their kids. And then it's later found out that they're not, that they're not their kids. And, and it's, uh, you know, again, it's just it's a really, really tough situation. It's awful what's happening there. Um, but the one thing that you can kind of be, you know, sure about is that the Biden administration has been 
working pretty hard to keep this a secret. That itself is kind of a scandal, is that they really are trying to deny the media and, um, and even some senators access or let them, you know, take pictures and videos. I mean, the Ted Cruz had to take this thing and was asked to stop. There was a Project Veritas video. That's the only videos that have that have come out about this stuff since the Biden administration has, has taken over um, since, you know, Biden's been president. And uh, the, Chris Wallace at Fox News, even even, you know, good old Chris Wallace, uh, even he was like, I mean, they are being substantially less transparent than the Trump administration was with their uh, their their um, border enforcement, and letting the media see it, letting the country see it. And uh, again, it's like, it's just a tough situation. And I don't know, like, I'm really open to what people think the, the correct solution is. Um, but you got these kids there, they're, you know, they're right on top of each other. They're, they're just in these awful conditions. And I don't know, I mean, like, what do you do with them? Like, I really will say that my, um, like my instincts uh, on this and where like what my gut feeling on it is, is like, just let them go. Like, stop holding them in these, you, you know, these, these facilities. This is not how any kids should be living. But I just don't know what you do with them. And, I, and I'm open to, you know, arguments about that. But like, what do you do with these kids? Where, where do you send them? What? And then what do you do? And then, and then the other, you know, real question is then what do you do? Even if you can, let's say you can get them all into foster care or something like that. I don't know. Maybe some of them have their actual guardians here. You let them in. What do you do with the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of more that keep coming behind them over and over again? Like, what is the answer here? What's the humanitarian answer? And, you know, I, I guess according to, you know, um, the Democrats uh, uh, essentially like like the hard left wing of the Democrats is like open the borders and also give them free health care and free housing and also make sure that you don't check whether they're voting or not or, you know, whatever. I mean, obviously, the five year olds aren't voting. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. That doesn't that doesn't seem to be a great answer. That doesn't seem to be fair. Like, you know, I so uh, again, I just I really don't know what the uh, the correct position exactly is on these things, but it is. Man, it is heartbreaking. So, all right. What else? Uh, what else did you want to talk about? Oh yeah, you said uh, Biden's uh, proposing another uh, spending bill. How about that? If there's one thing we have not been doing enough of in the last year, Rob, it is uh, spending. Yeah, we really each, need to spend some more. With each stimulus bill, they kind of, uh, I guess, pretend. Hey, we we only got to do this once. It's like an addict, you know. At last time. And so I think Trump got through two of them. I think the first mm -hmm. one off the top of my head, the first one was like 1.5. Then it was like the 900 billion. And then well, Biden... I think the, no, I think the first one was over two. I think he got one that was over two. And then there was one that was like eight, eight, nine. That was less. Billion. Right. Because that's when that was the big argument over um, that was before the election. Mm -hmm. And then Biden came along and he point passed one, which was what was it? 1.7. 1.9 but yeah I okay think it was 1. And, 9, I and now there's a conversation a new one for 1.9 um which would include a lot of um infrastructure building uh but this is on top of the fact that there already is a lot of news around whether or not we're going to see inflation um yeah. which i think at some point i mean it it, it, it has to happen but it just I, I i don't know it's like we're competing each president to see who can spend the most yeah well that's exactly right um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting with all of these things, watching the, just the unbelievable, like lack of understanding of basic economic principles and, and how you can just see the holes in the logic, you know, like just the, the so for the last 1.9, uh, uh, trillion dollar spending bill and Joe Biden's bragging uh, he was bringing his press conference and in a couple other times that he spoke about how much good it's done and how much this is going to bring down poverty. Like less people are going to be poor now because we just gave them checks. And of course, if you just measure it in that sense, it's like, well, yeah, I get, you know, you give someone a check, they have that checks worth more money. OK, like, yes, that is that is the most surface level simplistic way of of looking at it. But if you just scratch around, I mean, like, you don't have to be a professional economist. If you just scratch around at this a little bit more, you know, and take it to its logical conclusion, you'd go like, okay, but if 
if $1.9 trillion, you know, I mean, obviously most of it was corporate welfare, but if, if sending checks to people, you know, alleviates poverty, well then why not alleviate poverty more, right? Like why not send them more checks? Why not bigger checks? Why, why would there ever be a roof on this? If all, if you're going to look at me with a straight face and tell me that this is nothing but good, that there's no downside to this, then uh, okay, like cut, I mean, I'm, like cut everyone a hundred thousand dollar check. Like cut, why, why are we like playing around with these little $1,400 numbers? Well, the fact that we are at least indicates that, that everyone acknowledges that, well, there has to be a limit, right? Because at some point this would be problematic. It's not just will alleviate more and more and more poverty, right? At some point you're like, oh, this will destroy everything, right? So then you start to ask yourself, well, when is that point? Because holy shit, are we coming close to what seems like inevitably that point? And the idea that you would go, you know, this, it, it really is like kind of this Keynesian, I guess, mindset, but the idea that you'd go, oh, right now we need, we need nicer infrastructure. I mean, like, if you just think about the mentality of this, like, it'd be like if you were like, um, um, you know, it, 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 within your own house, like you're like, well, I lost my job and I maxed out my credit cards and now nobody's got a job in, in my house. And man, I don't know how we're ever going to pay back all this debt we have because we have no money coming in and all of this debt. And you're like, well, what do you, what do you want to do about this? It's like, well, at this point we need to buy a new sofa. I mean, that's really what we need, right? We need some more stuff. I mean, this is like, it's, it's so bananas to think that like, that's that that's the solution to all this. Let's buy some more stuff for ourselves. Let's spend some more money on our infrastructure. That'll really solve all of these problems. Like, man, this is, uh, um, I will say, uh, like we've talked about this for years now and granted, I'm, I'm surprised that they've been able to make it this long, but this is not going to go on for much longer. This is not going to go on for much longer before this whole thing really starts spinning. Uh, out of control. So there's a, uh, we, we, it might be a bumpy ride coming up for this country in the next couple of years with uh, the prospect of COVID passports, uh, inflation, and really just, and, and the truth is that they're already there where they've really lost control of the monetary policy and the fiscal policy. It's, it's spinning out of control in a way like we've never seen before. Um, so it, anyway, it'll be interesting to see if this, uh, if this bill ends up getting passed. I, I, you know, after all the last ones and with the Democrats having control, even if slim control, having control of the legislator, uh, they, I think they've got a good shot at passing another, another $2 trillion bill. So we'll see. It might not be the full 2 trillion, but yeah. it's going to pass. It, there will be a bill that passes. And then also, I mean, if you want to talk about that border crisis or Trump trying to get a wall built, I don't think it was a $2 trillion project. Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, man. Oh, does that money look like chump change uh, <laughs> now in hindsight? Yeah, that looks like absolutely nothing. Listen, I do. Uh, I, I got to run. Uh, I, I apologize. We're a little bit short. I, it was my fault. I started a little bit late, but we will be back soon with a brand new episode. Thank you, everybody for listening. Peace. Oh, 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 not peace. Come check us out at Pork Fest. Come check us out. Uh, check me out at Freedom Fest. Check Robbie the Fire out at Childeberg. Check out Rob's other show, Run Your Mouth. Fantastic podcast. And follow him on Twitter at Robbie the Fire. All right. Peace.